Yeah, no, no, it's fine. I should be slightly more organised than being ringy. Okay, sorry. I thought he was in the meantime. <laughs> Are you from Freya again? Yeah, I'm in Oxford as well. Oh, you're Oxford as well? Yeah. Okay, so you already know Ace? No. No? Okay, great. So, you so same institution? Oh, goodness me. Oh, okay. Do you know Shelley? Shelley Lakish, she's in Nuffield. Was in Nuffield. I don't know, but she's an ecologist, similarly, uh, similarly isolated oh, from her peers. Yeah, so, yeah, so I think she. I'm not sure if he's still there, but yeah, was there for the last two years, uh, last year or two. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. So Robert Payton's from Oxford. Is Oxford dominated? <laughs> Bill. of BES. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. My name's Chris Murray. I'm going to be the chair. I'm from Imperial College. I've um, got a really cool lineup of speakers today. I've got eight, eight talks, uh, 15 minutes each. They're going to run for 13 minutes plus two minutes question time. Uh, so I strongly encourage you to think of some nice questions to ask the, the speakers and get the most out of the session. Speakers, if you want to finish a minute or two early, if you can, you get a bit more interaction with the audience, which is also nice as well. Um, so without further delay, I'm going to introduce the first speaker. This is Ace North from University of Oxford. Uh, and uh, he's going to be talking about disease in metapopulations, <coughs> the role of migration range. So thanks very much, Ace. Thanks, Chris. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, open this really interesting looking session. So uh, this talk's going to be rather theoretical. So um, I hope you're, you're feeling awake. And hopefully this will wake you up if you're not. So disease in metapopulations is a, a topic which is of interest to, uh, to a number of people and uh, really, really they fall into two groups. So there's, um, it's of interest to, uh, to uh, epidemiologists who are managing diseases of humans and livestock and so on. And uh, the other group is conservation biologists because if you're trying to manage the conservation of, a, of an in endangered metapopulation, then um, the risk of diseases infiltrating and, and, and affecting the, the persistence of that metapopulation is something that I think should be taken into consideration. And uh, so that's the focus of, of the work I'm going to present to you. 
And uh, more specifically, I'm going to focus on, uh, on three questions. Um, how does the dispersal behavior of, of, this, of the host species, and possibly the pathogen as well, uh, influence the susceptibility of the metapopulation? How does the, uh, the underlying landscape structure, the arrangement of the patches, affect the susceptibility? And what's the role of the pathogen biology? So to answer that, um, I'm going to extend a, a classical metapopulation model into a spatially explicit model. And uh, the classical metapopulation model was first dis uh, developed by George Hess in 1996, and uh, it's uh, shown by this simple diagram. So there's three types of, of patches in the system, uninfected, infected, and empty, and there are these processes connecting them, infection and recolonization and so on. And you can see that uh, the, the width of the arrows uh, represent the... the, the, the magnitude of these processes. So if you become infected, then, then the extinction rate of your population may be higher and you're less good at recolonizing empty patches. So George Hess uh, developed this model as a conservation biologist to, to uh, investigate the role of migration rate. So migration rate, he, can, he, he assumed, uh, increases both the recolonization rate and the infection rate. So there's a conflict there and he showed that uh, um, the, the system can tend to different types of equilibrium depending on the magnitude of the migration rate. So it could tend to an equilibrium where you have infected and uninfected uh, patch types uh, coexisting or all infected, or if there's a low migration rate, then the infection may not be able to, to establish. Um, since this paper, there's been several very interesting extensions. Um, First, Gorg et al. and McCallum and Dobson in 2002 looked at multiple host species and, and the effects of uh, having resistance class populations. And uh, more recently, uh, Harding et al. Uh, looked at Ali effects and uh, other, other um, biological features like uh, infection in a dispersal matrix. So uh, this is a, a nice body of work, but uh, uh, the focus of, of most of this work is, is on the, the role of the migration rate, how many dispersers leave uh, the uh, uh, populations. Um, there's been less focus on migration range, how far do the dispersers go when they leave the patches. So that's what I'm uh, going to describe to you now. And just to be more clear about that, uh, if we imagine a, a spatially explicit patch landscape then we can consider the, the colonization effort of a, a focal patch is, uh, is uh, going mostly to neighboring patches. And uh, we can describe that with a function called the migration kernel. And um, what, what I want to consider is what happens when you change the, the breadth of the migration kernel. So if you, if you imagine very long migration kernel, you, you actually get to the results of, of Hess and the other papers where uh, the migrants go equally to all the other patches. And the second question I look at is the, the role of uh, landscape structure. So I, I consider the different uh, degrees by which the patches are themselves clustered uh, compared to the case where they're not clustered at all, where it's a kind of random landscape. So to look at this, this model, um, one thing we can do is just to, to simulate it. So I'm going to show you a simulation here. And the red dots here are representing occupied patches, the green dots unoccupied patches. And I'll introduce blue, which is the infection. And uh, the only difference between these two squares is the migration range of the, uh, of the host population. So we see that, uh, well, it happened very quickly, but the, the uh, the infection spread much more quickly in this uh, square with the longer migration range, uh, although the infection did spread in this square too, it was a, a different kind of process. Um, as well as uh, looking at these, this model with simulations, I, I wanted to do some more analytical work to, to get a, a kind of more general understanding of the behavior of the model. So. Uh, um, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but um, I, I used a method called uh, 
uh, I use spatial moment equations where you can describe the dynamics of the system by, uh, by the, by the uh, system of differential equations uh, that, uh, that uh, include both uh, uh, the densities of the, the different patch states and the covariances between them. So you can write a system of uh, moment equations. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't become a closed system, so I use an, an approximation method to solve this, these equations uh, called perturbation expansion around the mean field, which gives an idea of, uh, of how the system behaves when you take it away from the, moment, the, the mean field model, which is the, the kind of original Hess model. So I'm going to give you some results now. And uh, this is uh, perhaps the kind of key result that uh, where I looked at the establishment rate R star, which is the, uh, the number of uh, secondary infections from a, 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 a low first uh, density of, of infected patches equivalent to R naught in uh, classical epidemiology, the kind of mean metapopulation equivalent to that. And uh, what I find is that uh, um, the, in, in the spatially explicit model, the host population has a tendency to, to, uh, to have a clustered distribution because the dispersal is limited. And uh, if the infection starts off in a randomly chosen uh, host population, it can take advantage of that because the other host populations will be, will be on average closer and it has a higher rate of establishment than the mean field. If you start in a random patch, which may be the case if, if the infection arrives in the metapopulation by, a, by an infected host from, a, from another, another place and they uh, colonize a random patch, then, then you actually have a lower establishment rate because there's uh, less, pop, less patches are occupied. Uh, in total. Um, second thing is the, the, uh, the underlying landscape structure. So uh, uh, having correlation in the landscape actually increases the establishment rate of the infection because that uh, further enhances the degree to which the patches are aggregated. If the patches are also uh, kind of coming and going, uh, uh, turning over uh, as a kind of exogenous process, that reduces the establishment rate because that reduces the extent to which the, the host population kind of has a natural tendency to, to aggregate. So, um, so, yeah, so, so in conclusion, the host spatial structure increases the pathogen establishment. And uh, uh, the next thing to look at is not the, just the establishment uh, kind of at time zero, but the whole dynamics. How, how does the uh, local migration affect that. So, in, so in this, uh, these dashed lines here represent the uh, the uh, the mean field case where you don't assume there's any local dispersal, and it's uh, 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 how, how does the infection increase then? And uh, and what's more interesting is the difference when you include the spatial structure, which uh, is given by this approximation of the the solid lines. And we see that the infection actually uh, ends up uh, at a lower level um, in the spatial model and, uh, and, and uh, increases at a lower rate. And the reason is um, because of the, the covariance uh, as the infection builds in the landscape. So the infection tends to infect uh, local susceptible populations, and that, uh, that generates a um, negative covariance to the uh, uninfected susceptible populations, and that's seen in this brown curve here. So just to summarize, um, it's easier, we, uh, kind of overall conclusion is that it's usually easier for a pathogen to establish if the host is short dispersing because the host has, a, has an aggregated distribution, and this is not, not really uh, commented much in, in, uh, in in studies on uh, metapopulations uh, and disease spread. Um, but it's important to consider the, the traits that affect where the host uh, arrives, because uh, if the host can arrive in a, a random patch, then, then this effect is, is not going to be important. But in, con in contrast, the subsequent invasion is, is uh, more difficult for the, in for the 
uh, pathogen if uh, the host is uh, spatially structured because the host becomes spatially separated from the, from the infection. And uh, if the landscape has an underlying correlated structure, then both effects are, are enhanced. Uh, so the kind of conflict becomes stronger. Okay, that's it. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Ace. I didn't even have to use my one minute warning oh. signal there, so it's good. We have a couple of, uh, a, a little bit of extra time for questions. So happy to take some questions for Ace. Any hands? Yes. Um, so if you consider um, hosts that can't move, like plant hosts, um, could you use these sorts of models for recommending plant structures for agricultural systems where you want to avoid spreading a pathogen to a new field, for instance? So, So you're considering that the, the host is not dispersing and recolonizing. The, the, the host isn't technically dispersed. Right. The cues move it around. Say, for instance, you have like a, a wheat field. You want to establish a wheat field somewhere where you're not going to get infected. Um, yeah, I, I guess you could use the, the model to, 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 to simulate that. But you, you'd have to think about the the dispersal of the host in a very different way. If it's, if it's not kind of distance dependent, if it's human mediated, it might not be really distance dependent. Uh, uh, but then the, the dispersal of the pathogen is something that, that is, would still be distance dependent. So yeah, I haven't looked at that kind of situation. Okay, okay perhaps I'll, I'll ask a question. Just wondering, um, what would your sort of uh, how would you how would you summarise the the, the the field of, um, for example, uh, habitat fragmentation or, or, or disturbance and the, the link with with uh, infectious disease, either emergence or infectious disease um, spread, for example, in the context of your of your model, of course. Uh, <laughs> that's. Uh, um So, 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 for example, I guess sorry, frag no, fragmentation no. and habitat loss is a is, is one um, process that can increase right. disease risk right. um, through th through the, the processes that you're kind of talking about. And I'm just wondering what your metapopulation type type model or interpretation of those that kind of thing is. Any any sort of general uh, general take homes, I guess. Yeah, I guess one of the things there is that uh, fragmentation also introduces can introduce more pathogens into the system. So what I haven't looked at is uh, kind of landscapes that start in one kind of quality level and, and degrade to another, or changing it, kind of introduction pressure of, of the pathogen, which I think uh, you kind of need to do to really get a hold on those questions. But uh, I mean, this is a model that could be maybe extended somehow in that direction. Okay, cool. All right, thanks. We're, we're uh, out of time for ACE. Um, just give a, another round of, round of applause. Thanks. Um, next speaker, I'd like to introduce Freya Shearer, uh, also from Oxford, although apparently unknown to ACE, different department. Um, and uh, Freya's going to be going to be talking uh, about the prediction of um, geographical variation in, in human infection risk for vector-borne uh, zoonotic pathogens. <coughs> Thanks, Chris. Um, so I'm a PhD student and I focus on human risk of vector-borne zoonotic disease. Um, today, um, oh, hang on a sec. Sorry, I work on vector-borne zoonotic pathogens. Um, today I want to split my uh, talk into a couple of parts. Um, first I'm going to speak about mapping um, Plasmodium nolsey malaria, and um, then which was some early work in my PhD, and then I want to speak about um, some of my current work on um, 
yellow fever. So for mapping Plasmodium nosy malaria, I used the standard SDM approach. Um, so species distribution models, or SDM, has been used, has been applied to epidemi epidemiology um, a lot in the last 10 years. Um, and uh, so this is one reason why I used it to um, analyze my data set. Um, so Plasmodium nosy malaria is a vector-borne um, zoonotic pathogen. Um, it has a reservoir in various macaque species, including Macaca fascicularis, which is on the left there, and is transmitted among macaques and to humans by Anopheles mosquitoes. Um, it is one of six Plasmodium species that is known to infect humans and cause malaria. Um, the, uh, the top five um, are principally transmitted between humans, um, from human to human via mosquitoes. Um, Plasmodium nolsey is a, um, so Plasmodium nolsey is um, transmitted primarily, it's only transmitted from humans, but from, from macaques to humans. Um, and there's currently no evidence of naturally occurring human to human transmission. Um, malaria nolsey is often misdiagnosed as one of the um, human malarias because it, it looks very, very similar under a micros microscope and most health facilities don't have the diagnostic um, capacity to um, have the correct PCR methods to identify malaria nolsey. So, um, but it does, it can cause um, severe symptoms and death in some cases. Um, so the distribution of malaria nolsey is presumably localised to where its um, reservoir and vector species occur um, because both of these components are required for transmission to humans. So this is a map of regions uh, with evidence for the presence of a nolsey reservoir. Um, that evidence included infections in humans, macaques or mosquitoes um, and among many other things. Um, and this became our um, study region um, for, the, for, the, for the project. Um, you'll notice that many of these countries are in the process of eliminating the human malarias um, and that for, that's one reason why it's important to understand the geographical distribution of nosy malaria because in order to understand the residual malaria cases that will be that we will still see once the um, once the human malarias have been eliminated. So, as I said, mentioned before, I used a standard SDM approach, um, specifically a boosted regression trees model. So, the model combines um, information on locations where the disease has been reported um, with socioeconomic, biological, and environmental covariate data at those locations. Um, it, is, uh, it can fit complex non-linear relationships and um, automatically handles interaction effects between potential predictors. Um, so this shows you, so the red dots and the pink polygons are locations where malaria nolsey has been reported in humans, macaques or mosquitoes. Um, and there's also some absence and background data shown on that map as well, which is also required for the model. Um, you'll notice that most of the occurrence data is clustered in Malaysia, Brunei and Singapore. Um, I'm not going to discuss in this talk how I dealt with some of those data biases, but um, if you're interested, come and speak to me afterwards. Um, we also supplied the model with a range of environmental, socioeconomic and biological covariate data. Um, so this is the final output. Um, so it shows an index of risk of Plasmodium nosy malaria transmission from the known reservoir and vector species. Areas in green are low risk or zero risk of intransmission through to um, high predicted risk in purple. Areas outside the range of the known reservoir and vector species are all green because the um, transmission risk would be zero in those locations. So that's a very uh, quick overview of um, that project, uh, really just to demonstrate the use of a standard SDM approach for an epidemiological data set. Um, and this work was published earlier this year by PLOS NTDs, um, so more information about the methods and outputs can be found there. Shortly after I finished this project on Plasmodium nosy, um, 
There was a yellow fever outbreak earlier this year in Angola, which had started to get international attention. And I embarked on a process to map the global distribution of yellow fever. Um, so yellow fever is a viral hemorrhagic fever. It's endemic in tropical South Africa, I mean, so tropical South America and Africa. Um, the disease is conspicuously absent from Asia, um, despite the opportunity, multiple opportunities for introduction, and um, the apparent uh, presence of all components for a suitable transmission system, including common infected populations, there's never been local transmission there. Um, it's vaccine preventable. There's wildlife reservoirs. Um, there's two. There's a coexistence of two transmission cycles, um, a zoonotic cycle and also an interhuman transmission cycle. Um, interhuman transmission vectored by the Aedes aegypti mosquito can cause very large scale urban outbreaks, such as the one in um, Angola and DRC this year, uh, where so far there's been around 960 cases and about 200 deaths. Um, so the international community has been very concerned about where the disease would spread next. Um, and what, because the global distribution of yellow fever is poorly characterised, um, people have been using maps of Aedes aegypti to predict disease risk, um, which doesn't really give us the whole picture because um, while the vector is necessary for transmission, it's not, it's not, there's other factors that are contributory, it's not sufficient. And also the disease is vaccine preventable. So if any estimates of risk are not incorporating vaccination coverage, um, then it's likely that we'll overpredict risk in areas where vaccine coverage is high. Um, so the data available for modeling um, yellow fever are these occurrence locations or locations where infections have been reported. Um, so I could have mapped it using a standard SDM approach but this didn't give me a way um, of incorporating the vaccine coverage. So fortunately, the um, SDM ecological literature has, literature has been proposing um, that point process models are an appropriate way to analyse occurrence-only data. Um, and this does provide a way for incorporating other factors such as vaccine coverage. <coughs> so, um, so the idea is that um, you have a pattern, a point pattern, of locations where a disease or also a species has been identified or cited. Um, and this can be described using an intensity function over space, lambda s, which is also um, the expected number of points or observations per unit area. Um, I assumed that the point pattern for yellow of reports of yellow fever arose from um, three independent processes. Um, the environmental component of force of infection, so the number of cases per person over the course of a study period, the fraction of the population susceptible to infection and the reporting rate for infections. Um, and then, well, I'll go back one. So we fitted a Poisson point process boosted regression tree model to the point pattern of yellow fever reports. Um, and then and specified, along with a set of environmental covariates, and then specified R and I, um, or R and P, a priori. Um, so R was drawn from a set of um, reports of PCR diagnosable infections in humans other than yellow fever, and um, P was um, assumed to be the num was the number of people we drew directly from the number of people who. Um, were, um, had not received a yellow fever vaccine. <coughs> uh, so this, this is a very preliminary map um, of yellow fever. Um, it shows the index, an index for environmental force of infection. Um, a higher number of cases per person over the study period um, is shown in the dark green and um, lower rates that are grey or close to white. Um, I haven't finished my uh, vaccine coverage map, so this assumes that 100% of the population is susceptible to infection. Um, so the next steps for me include finalising the model, um, including some model checking and evaluation. Um, I'd like to potentially predict the environmental suitability for infection in Asia. Um, 
and then maybe estimate the number of people at risk globally. Um, hopefully this will assist in vaccination planning um, because the Angolan outbreak highlighted that there were some vulnerabilities in the international outbreak response strategy. Um, the global vaccine stockpiles were actually depleted after about two months of the um, outbreak and they resorted to using um, a fifth of the normal dose, um, expecting that would provide short-term immunity um, for people. Um, yeah, thank you for listening. Uh, and <laughs> that's my supervision team on Christmas jumper day at BS last year. So, <laughs> any questions? Thank you, Freya. Yes, um, still have another couple of minutes. So, yeah, questions would be most welcome. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> you last one, you're part of the, of the work. Uh, you have a highly fragmented uh, case with all these islands. How do you account for that in the SDN approach? The first, the very first part. Yeah. Um, what aspect do you think well, expect would be challenging with that? Uh, you can have uh, dispersal constraints that may explain. Yep. Um, yeah, it was it was quite challenging because um, so for example with um, the the macaques for like the reservoir, um, we had to sort of attain um, when we were getting range maps, we had to determine if um, a particular island had like ever sighted a um, that particular species of macaque and obtain that information sort of separately from experts who lived on the island or um, and things like that. So and then also when we were creating. Um, we often had like a, a buffer zone um, for where we were going to predict to. Obviously, it didn't make sense sometimes if maybe we said 300 kilometres, if that over went over an island there, we knew something wasn't there, then that would be challenging. So, yeah, it was quite an intricate progress process and not the same as having a big land mass where you could just say, yeah, we should predict the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, nice. No, so um, so they're both they're incorporated as an offset, um, and then R wasn't sort of so I used um, I drew the quadrature points um, or integration points as some people call them from that um, set of locations where other things have been reported but not yellow fever, and then um, the so the vaccine map was like the values <laughs> that was to a resolution of the same resolution as my prediction. And so like I could incorporate an offset value for each presence location, if that makes sense. Uh, thanks. Anyway, we could, I can talk to you later if that helps. Great, okay, thanks very much Freya. Um, that's all we've got time for. So another round of applause for Freya, thanks. <laughs> okay, now I'd like to introduce uh, Josephine Walker from the University of Bristol. Um, Josephine's going to be talking about host allometry influences the evolution of parasite host generalism, uh, theory and meta-analysis. Thanks very much, Josephine. Um, hi, thank, thanks for the introduction. And um, as you can see, I've changed the title slightly to make it less complex. <laughs> um, but essentially what I'm going to be talking about today is um, a study that came out of the uh, Special Interest Group in Parasites and Pathogens Transmission Retreat, um, which some, some people in this room were at. And so all of the people listed here as authors, um, oops, how does this work? Um, we're, we're at that retreat and um, we, we all tried to pull this together. So it's quite an interdisciplinary and uh, sort of s parallel project that went on for all of us. So um, essentially what we wanted to do is look at uh, combining a theoretical model with data to think about how host generalism of parasites um, might be able to evolve. So just to, to uh, define some key points initially, um, by allometry, we're talking about the scaling relationship between uh, physiology and body size. So for example, that might be a relationship between a reproductive or, or mortality rate and body size. Um, and 
then parasite host generalism is the diversity of hosts that a parasite infects. And there's a variety of different ways to measure that, which I'll get into later, but it could just simply be the number of host species or some measure of uh, phylogenetic distance between the host species. Um, and so what we're interested in is thinking about the difference between specialist parasite species which infect a single host or generalists infecting um, a range of hosts, however we define that. Um, and then thinking about how, uh, well, it's known that parasite traits such as host-seeking behavior or the number of hosts in a life cycle um, or infection site, such as if it's an endo or ectoparasite, are already correlated with um, host generalism. And here we focus more on the side of the host traits. So whether body size, um, for example, is also related to this parasite trait of host generalism. And um, so, as I mentioned, we're trying to develop a theoretical model, um, but which in this case was looking at the evolution of host generalism um, and using uh, allometric relationships to link that uh, transmission model into host traits and then compare these model predictions to data and we used an existing database of macroparasites of fish for this. So more specifically, we narrowed down to questions um, related to body size. So are parasites that infect larger bodied hosts more likely to be generalists? Um, and related to temperature, so are parasites that infect hosts that live in warm environments more likely to be generalists? And this was based on the data that was available within our um, database and what was possible in terms of the allometric relationships. So because there are so many different elements of just outlining, first I'll talk about a few elements of the model and then come to the data. So um, the transmission model structure, essentially um, we used uh, something like an S SI model. So we had susceptible fish um, and infected fish and then fish were able to become infected again. So it wasn't a, really a quantified number of infections, a number of parasites infecting a host, but we um, had, we allowed for uh, sort of two levels of, of infection. And then the parasite has a free living stage um, in the environment. Um, host populations grow uh, with logistic growth. And then we examined a few different scenarios, including um, different transmission routes, so whether we assume that the parasite is transmitted trophic through trophic uh, transmission, so by being consumed and infecting that way, or um, direct transmission, such as just floating around in the environment and encountering hosts as it comes along. Um, the model then is extended to have multiple hosts in this, uh, in the same, with the same structure, uh, including each host having a specialist parasite. And then we take that model where we have multiple hosts, multiple specialist parasites, and we introduce a generalist parasite. So the generalist parasite can infect both hosts and has some cost um, in the form of a reduced rate of reproduction in order to make it not just be a parasite that can invade no matter what. Um, and we ask whether this generalist parasite can invade the system um, or in in terms of invasion analysis, on whether the equilibrium where there's zero generalist parasites is unstable, meaning that um, when you introduce the generalist parasites, it would increase. And we looked at a variety of different scenarios, um, which I'm not gonna go into much detail on, but we can talk about if you're interested. Um, <clears throat> so that was the, the sort of transmission element of the model, and we introduced allometric scaling to relate it to host traits. So, um, in the model, we have a carrying capacity because of the logistic growth. We have um, reproductive rates for the, uh, the hosts, um, and we have mortality rates, and all of these are then linked to body size and temperature through relationships that are established in the um, allometry literature. So parasite abundance um, is assumed to scale with host mass to the three-quarters power for endoparasites because of the volume uh, scaling relationship and to the 512th power for ectoparasites because of the surface area scaling relationship, um, <laughs> for example. So all of these uh, allometric relationships were then added into the um, transmission model. And we use that to predict when you change the host traits, 
how that affects when the generalist parasites can invade. So that's the quick overview of the model. Um, and so for the data side, uh, we focused on fish because of the availability of an extensive database on macroparasites of fish. Um, so there's more than 38,000 records of associations. This was published by uh, Strona um, and, and others in 2013. So this database is available. Um, and it also includes host, uh, trait information for the host species. So this is really essential for our project. Um, we added some extra parasite species and, and traits which hadn't been included. Um, for example, there were no it was only helminths, so we added some crustacean parasite species. And we cleaned, cleaned it up for our purposes by limiting it to uh, definitive rather than intermediate hosts to make the calculation of generalism a bit simpler, um, con double checking the species names. And then the other additional thing that we did is uh, gathered a lot of DNA sequences for the hosts to calculate the, uh, be able to calculate pairwise genetic distances between different host species. So once we had all of that, um, we still had more than 23,000 host parasite associations to work with, and that's between uh, but more than 8,000 parasite species and 4,000 fish hosts. So um, another level of complexity here is this, as I mentioned, the different ways of measuring generalism. So instead of uh, picking one simple measure, we, we went actually report four different measures. So one, uh, the first one is degree, which is simply the number of hosts, the easiest way to just count up how many hosts is, that each parasite is reported to infect. Um, and then ev perhaps even simpler than that, the, uh, just whether it has one or more hosts as a binary measure. And then um, essentially because you can measure generalism in the same way you measure any type of diversity, now we're looking at uh, phylogenetic diversity of the hosts. So we had two measures based on that um, pairwise genetic distance between each of the hosts. One which was just the distance um, averaged and the other one is a comparison of whether the hosts were more closely related than expected by chance from the pool of hosts that we were working with. So for the results, um, again, first I'll uh, just show you a little bit of what we found in the data and then come back to these two questions, whether um, large body hosts are more, like, uh, more likely to have generalized parasite species and um, warm environments. So uh, in this database, we found that 61% of parasites had only one host, so um, quite a few, but not a majority of the um, parasites were generalist in terms of their host numbers. And the maximum observed number of hosts was 188, but almost all of the hosts had um, five or fewer hosts. And interestingly also, 88% um, of, of the generalist parasites had hosts that were more closely related to each other than expected by chance from the pool of hosts. So uh, now for these uh, results, I'm gonna first say what we saw from the model and then how it uh, compared to what we saw in the database. And it, with the model predictions for host body size, we in general saw um, a positive correlation between um, host generalism and host body size for directly transmitted parasites, but this relationship wasn't so clear for trophically transmitted parasites. Now in the data, um, we compared several different measures of host length to the general, several of generalism metrics. So here I'm just showing one example of SPD, which is one of the phylogenetic measures, but they all look pretty similar in this case. Um, we saw a positive correlation between maximum host length and the coefficient of variation in host length, um, but it, not with mean host length where we saw a small negative correlation. So um, this, and this pattern was also essentially the same in the data for the trophically transmitted parasites, which doesn't match up with the model prediction where there was a, a difference between the directly versus trophically transmitted ones. And then for um, the temperature, uh, the model predictions, um, here you can see some examples of the types of scenarios that we looked at, whether co-infection was allowed, um, of whether the 
parasites themselves can avoid non-susceptible hosts and constant host population size. So there's a, we have a long table of the different scenarios we looked at, and we could get a different uh, re results depending on the scenario. Um, but in the data, we did see that there was generally a higher uh, number of host species per parasite in the cooler regions compared to the warmer regions, but it's a very, very rough measure where we basically used uh, geographical regions to decide how warm it was. Um, and uh, in trophically transmitted parasites, uh, m most of the generalism metrics were higher in the cool regions. Um, but this is also confounded by the host body size. So we did also did a multivariate analysis. Um, but essentially, with, with having such a broad measure, it's uh, a little bit difficult to say. So what we did is we took the theoretical model um, and compared it to, to these observed patterns in the data. Um, and because the model predictions were so sensitive to the model scenarios, uh, we can't really say anything strongly about those specific questions that we looked at, um, but uh, I think the, one of the main lessons is that by defining this explicit model and um, dem trying different scenarios, we're allowing for examination of, of proposed verbal models that people might hy just hypothesize um, and can really narrow down under what conditions of prediction might apply. And f this limitation of using um, the data, existing data, which was collected for a totally different purpose, that doesn't exactly match the model. But if we work with the data set and the, to try to, again, drive what we can look at in the model and vice versa, then we can um, untangle some of the conflicting uh, observations that have been seen in different studies. So that's, uh, that's what I'm trying to take home from this. Anyway, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Joseph. And we have time for a couple of quick questions. Can't see any hands. Okay, I'll. I'll oh. Is there one? Sorry, yes. In the model where the, the generalism would increase the host body size, what's the mechanism like in the model that causes that increase? So that has to do with the relationship between host body size and. Um, the assumed relationship between host body size and the reproductive and uh, rates of the host and the um, carrying capacity of the host. So it's built in, that, that is that allometric um, link. So I, I can't say exactly what the equation is at the moment, but um, it was based on using the idea that body size scales with other traits which are related to transmission. Um. A very quick. Yeah. Sorry, is there somebody back there? Can you can you get, can everybody stick their hands right up in the air so I can see <laughs> it? Yep. Thanks. And so, was your model like a one point equation? Yes, it was a, a differential equation model. No. So we the in the model it was a very simplified version. So most of the scenarios we were looking at having. Uh, two host species, but we also looked at extending that, to generalizing it to a larger number of host species. Okay. Yeah. So I asked the question, was there any evolution in that? Or was it just to save No, the only evolution, uh, evolutionary element was that we were doing this invasion analysis. So looking at a situation where you have very that's few. Not, that's not the evolution trait. Right, the exactly. Ecological. Yes. E so ecological evolution of in invasion. Uh, all the terminology is a little bit tricky. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think there is definitely some clarification that we could uh, make for that. Yeah. I just wonder if um, the evolution might have to antecedent um, uh, the, the question of whether it's Yeah. Sorry, guys, I might get you to follow up after yep, the no talk problem. so we can move <laughs> on to the next, um, next speaker. Uh, Robert Payton um, from the University of Oxford. Oxford, again, we have a, a domination of universities here. It's the University Challenge. Um, 
<laughs> Rob is going to be talking about the role of competition in it is Aegypti uh, mitigation, um, stochasticity and stability. Thanks, Robert. So hi everybody. Um, so my name's Rob and um, I'm part of Mike Bonzel's research group at the University of Oxford. I'm also co-supervised by Anthony Wilson, who's sitting right over there. Um, and my, my slides, um, my, my title actually differs slightly as well from what I submitted. Um, and what, what um, we were really interested in doing actually um, is bringing some sort of um, more complex ecological thinking um, into um, models of mitigation for Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. Um, and so I'll begin by just sort of quickly introducing the vector that we were thinking about. Um, and then I will go on to um, talk about the sort of uh, ecological theory that we were sort of putting into these models and some of the sort of um, preliminary results that we've gotten out. Because my caveat is that I am a first year. So translate that as you will, to, but translate it as rough around the edges. Um, so. Uh, so um, we were thinking about um, Aedes aegypti, um, and um, I'm sure lots of people in the audience will be very familiar with it, so I won't bore you too much with it. Um, but um, it's a vector of diseases such as Zika and Dengue, um, uh, Chikungunya, and it's a frustrating vector um, to sort of prevent transmission for, um, because it bites during the day, which is obviously a tricky feature, sort of for bed nets and things like that. Um, and so really the one of the most promising methods that we have um, for suppressing wild populations of Aedes aegypti um, is the use of GM mosquitoes and releasing male genetically modified mosquitoes that carry a construct that causes the larvae um, from these matings with the GM males to abort at a late larval stage. And obviously, um, with any new technology, there will come a sort of certain degree of sort of scepticism and public sort of um, uh, concern over it. And sort of beyond just fear of GM itself, obviously one of the things that people often ask um, is, well, what will be the ecological consequences of suppressing a vector in the wild? And it's not unreasonable, certainly, to, to highlight this. Um, you know, it's not an illegitimate fear. And so, what we wanted to do is um, sort of bring in some ecological um, thought into these models. And it struck us that the whole point of GM releases is to suppress Aedes aegypti down um, to a point where transmission is no longer possible, either through extinction or just past some threshold amount. And so we thought, well, th this is really sort of a stable state problem, that you're sort of trying to create a new stable state where Aedes aegypti is no longer a feasible vector. And so this brought us on to starting to think about the idea of potential or stability landscapes. So the idea of instead of just distilling it down into stable and unstable states with some sort of linear stability analysis, some sort of approximation technique, actually trying to sort of derive a surface that would describe how um, where the state space of, of the um, vector population is represented with a height that governs how likely, um, sorry, how stable um, if you imagine a ball being on its surface and the ball could represent the state of the system. And so as we release GM mosquitoes, what we would be doing is modifying this landscape of stability um, and creating a, a new state for Aedes um, uh, aegypti. And so if we take just a very, very simple model to start with, just um, we've got a continuous time model, very, very simple, where you've got GM insect releases that are suppressing the reproductive output of Aedes aegypti. Um, what we can see in this little animation here is that as you increase your release of GM mosquitoes, you change how many stable states there are, and separate, they're separated by an unstable saddle point state. And so what this got us thinking was, well, so for any given release, you're sort of creating this different landscape of stability, this different ecological stability landscape. And so we thought that, well, that's quite cool, that's quite interesting. And then we thought, so for any given surface that, that, you, that you create by releasing these GM insects and creating these new surfaces of stability, how would the, the current ecosystem state that we could represent as a ball 
change according to stochastic processes. So if we put on some, in our continuous time model, make it a stochastic differential equation and say, well, we're going to have some demographic, environmental, stochasticity, some migration, that sort of thing. And so this is analogous to sort of taking a given release and sort of bouncing the ball around on the surface. And what you would see is you would see that the, the properties of the different valleys and the different um, stable states that are represented as basins on the surface will dictate how likely the ball is to switch between states or just how much it, of the state space that it can explore for a given amount of stochastic process. Sort of, that's a horrible way of saying that. But, um, and so really what this got us thinking was, well, if, if we're doing this, if we're fundamentally altering the stability of ecosystems, and, and you know, obviously in this case for a legitimate reason, well, what could some of the consequences be? And one of the most obvious consequences that we could think of is that there's a secondary vector um, of, of these diseases in the form of Aedes albopictus. And Aedes albopictus is uh, sort of a, 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 growing, a, a growing population. It's um, invading areas where Aedes aegypti has previously been dominant. And there's some competitive interaction there. And so we thought, well, why don't we extend this um, idea of the stability surface into more dimensions for two vector species and think about how GM mosquito releases are going to um, alter, uh, uh, how GM mosquito releases will alter the competition between these two vectors. And so one thing that's quite interesting is that we have different competitive outcomes depending on what habitat you find these mosquitoes in. So sometimes you get competitive exclusion and sometimes you get um, coexistence. And so we, we're go I'm going to take two examples um, of the model where you get competitive exclusion and one where you get coexistence and see what releasing GM mosquitoes would in theory do to the stability of the populations. Um, so sorry, that's just a schematic of the model with the interspecific interactions included. Um, and so what we're really talking about here is the difference between, so this is imagining <coughs> our stability surfaces in three dimensions now. So you could have these different ranges of configurations of habitats and the properties of these basins will dictate what the dynamics you observe in the ecosystem will be. And so we're, we're looking here to see how GM mosquito, GM mosquito releases would change these stability landscapes. Um, in order to do this, we needed to go um, into the literature um, and into the big bad world of stochastic mathematics, which has melted my brain irreparably. Um, and so, um, but there's some really cool um, papers coming out on the um, analytical analysis of um, stochastic models to obtain these potential landscapes, these stability landscapes. And so um, we're, we're using stochastic differential equations here and we're using these quasi potentials, which are basically the stochastic analog of these stability surfaces that I showed in two dimensions earlier. Um, and another thing that we did was we also built an epidemiological model onto these uh, vector population dynamics. Because what we wanted to, to, to show and demonstrate is that the underlying um, stability landscape in the vector population will be up related to the epidemiological dynamics that you observe. So um, on top of this, um, of our basic vector model with our two species, um, we, we also put on just a very simple Ross McDonald model um, that just tracks the proportion of infected individuals in the population. So on to the results. Um, what we observed for the, um, if you have coexisting vectors and you introduce um, a GM mosquito release, is that you create the same sort of uh, bistable configuration that we observed for the single species model. And it's separated by this saddle point that is effectively an Ali effect. It's, it's, it's functionally, in terms of the model, the, the same sort of process. And so when, when, when we observed this, we sort of thought, well, in that case, the stochastic process um, will be able to potentially, for a given value of this um, uh, insect release, 
cause the ball uh, to shift from one state to the other. And so later on, I'll look at some simulation results that, um, that, that show that happening. And critically, what's interesting about having these multiple stable states is that in your two stable states of your vector, of your two vectors, will correspond to different epidemiological states. Um, and so if we now look at an example where um, only one vector can exist, as in there would be competitive exclusion in the environment, and we see that something different happens. You might expect that by uh, introducing GM mosquitoes into the environment that you would promote coexistence between um, vectors if Aedes aegypti was outcompeting Aedes albopictus. But actually what happens is that the stable configuration for Aedes aegypti just disappears. There is no stable coexistence point for um, the two vectors. And this actually happens purely because of the nature of the GM mosquito construct, which aborts at the late larval stage. And this ensures that any interspecific competition will have occurred in the larval habitat. And so looking at the simulations, that are, you can imagine that these are effectively the, um, revealing the relief of the underlying stability landscape, these simulations. You can see that in a bistable scenario, um, you can get these transitions between these two stable configurations of the ecosystem. Whereas if you are um, conducting a GM release where there's competitive exclusion of Aedes albopictus, you would only get a domination of Aedes albopictus. There are, there are no, because of the, um, the shallowness of the uh, stable state for Aedes aegypti, there, it, the ball will always end up being stochastically perturbed into the more stable of the two states. And as I said before, if we look at the epidemiology here, you can see that the top panel shows the, the bistable, um, out, the same bistable uh, dynamics that are observed for the vector populations are observed um, in the epidemiology, as in there's two different peaks depending on what stable state you're occupying. Whereas for um, the competitive exclusion scenario, you only get um, uh, sort of this sort of very reduced disease state. The only reason it's not at zero is because there's always a low level of um, stochastic introductions of in infected individuals in the model. And so um, just some broad conclusions. Um, really, there can be uh, a more complicated story than you would expect when it comes to mitigating disease vectors. You can create these stability surfaces that have more than one stable state and that stochastic processes are capable of shifting your, your system between these states. Um, and so I would just like to thank um, my supervisors and invite any questions. Thanks, Rob. We've probably got time for about half a question, so make it a quick one. <laughs> No, 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 absolutely. Um, well, there's been one, one paper has come out that's actually been looking at data from the field in terms of facilitating ADs, what one of the AD species by suppressing the other one. And the only problem with that data in that paper was that the Aedes albopictus was still actually spreading into that area when they suppressed Egypti. So I didn't entirely, I wasn't entirely convinced that whatever outcome you would see there would be indicative of a sort of a stable, uh, equilibrated system where everything had started competing with each other. Um, in terms of experiments, we're um, at the Purbright Institute, um, we're going to be looking at competition experiments between the two vectors. So there, there might be opportunities to try and build out competitive scenarios that might um, show the similar properties. Um, but actually our experiments will probably be more looking at the fundamental ecology of the vectors. Okay, thanks, Rob. Um, another round of applause while we welcome... <laughs> welcome Will Harvey uh, from the uh, University of Glasgow. Um, Will's going to be talking about using diversity analyses to examine the ecology of antibiotic resistance in closely linked human and livestock communities. Thanks, Will. <coughs> well, thanks, Chris. Um, so, yeah, today I'll be talking about antibiotic resistance in uh, northern Tanzania. Um, so my work is part of a larger collaboration involving uh, myself and colleagues in Glasgow 
uh, as well as researchers at Washington State University uh, and other partners, <coughs> uh, including in Tanzania. Uh, so we're interested in the ecological and socioeconomic drivers of antibiotic resistance in uh, the greater Serengeti ecosystem. Um, so these are the locations of our study sites in northern Tanzania, uh, close to the Kenyan border, um, which is shown there. Um, and we have, we have uh, villages including three ethnic groups, uh, and these differ in everything from uh, livestock management um, uh, processes to herd composition, social structures, uh, and access to antibiotics, uh, and both uh, human and veterinary healthcare. Um, so we're interested in what antibiotic resistance there is in this environment uh, and how it's been maintained. Um, the, qu the question seeking to answer is how uh, does antibiotic resistance persist um, in these communities and, and is the flow between uh, communities of bacteria, bacteria in uh, human and non-human hosts. Uh, we're using a, a Bayesian modeling approach to infer the genetic structure underlying the resistance that we see uh, and aiming to identify links between communities. Um, so to address this, we have fecal samples from uh, humans, dogs, chickens, sheep and goats, and cattle uh, from over 300 households. Um, e. coli has been isolated from these, uh, and we have uh, classified isolates as susceptible or resistant to uh, 10 different antibiotics uh, using breakpoint assays. Um, for each antibiotic, uh, in this case uh, trimethoprim, we're able to estimate the frequency of resistance uh, and break that down by ethnic group and uh, by host species. Um, so you can see that uh, levels of resistance are generally higher in the Arusha and Masa, Masai than in the Chaga, and the resistance is highest in the human population, followed by uh, dogs and chicken in the Masai and Chaga, and followed by cattle in the Arusha. Um, we actually see high levels of resistance to five of the ten antibiotics that we looked at, uh, and shown across the top here, we see that they have uh, actually a similar pattern in the way they're distributed among hosts. Um, the five on the bottom are um, much rarer, particularly in the Maasai and Chaga. Um, when we look at um, correlations between uh, which isolates these resistances are found in um, uh, and uh, cluster on this basis, um, these five common uh, uh, resistances are shown in the uh, box there. And this begins to uh, hint that they may be clustered in um, perhaps in a genetic uh, way. Um, <coughs> so for each isolate, we uh, define a resistance profile um, according to the combination of resistances present. So with five antibiotics, there are two to the five or 32 different possible profiles. Uh, and we actually find in our system that all 32 profiles are present. Um, so they're ordered here from the, um, from the uh, fully susceptible um, at the left-hand side through to the penta resistance uh, and coloured by the number of resistances. Um, and I think the most striking thing here is really that there's a, a real overabundance of the penta resistance uh, given the uh, abundances of the individual resistances, again hinting towards a, a non-independence. If we look within one of these ethnic groups, um, starting with the Maasai, uh, how these profiles are distributed across species, we see that uh, in the humans at the top, um, there's actually a higher number of penta resistance <coughs> than fully susceptibles. Um, and then moving to the dogs and chickens, um, there's a reduction in the penta, uh, penta resistance. Um, however, still quite a high um, number when we uh, consider that these animals uh, are not typically treated with antibiotics. We then see another further drop um, when we look at the sheep and goats and the cattle. Um, we see a similar pattern in the Arusha, albeit with a um, increase in the number of penta resistance in the uh, cattle. And in the Chaga, similar again, um, but starting from a much um, lower level of penta resistance in the human population. These kind of um, patterns across species um, cause us uh, to uh, hypothesize that there may be flow between um, host communities um, perhaps um, something like this with um, antibiotic um, uh, resistance uh, originating in the human population uh, and then possibly flowing into uh, dogs and chickens as a result of scavenging in uh, areas where sanitation practices um, are poor. Um, in these populations, we might then expect a loss of resistance 
um, due to the withdrawal of the selective pressure. Um, could have then be the dissemination into the environment uh, and to the grazing species, um, or perhaps more um, resistance occurring in the cattle again where antibiotics are used, and is there possibly a route from cattle to humans? Um, to investigate, we're using a Bos uh, Bayesian modeling approach um, based on that described in this paper here, uh, Denwood. Um, so the idea is that we use the pattern of co-occurrence of resistances to estimate the underlying genetic structures. So for example, where we have uh, isolates with multiple drug resistance, um, is it likely that this is due to the random co-occurrence of independent resistances or clustering on plasmids or other genetic elements uh, that may be horizontally transmitted and therefore more important for flow between communities. Um, and we hope that by making these inferences of the genetic genetics underlying the uh, observed uh, resistance profiles, we can learn about uh, persistence and flows uh, between communities. So with this kind of model that we're building, um, we have these uh, latent Bernoulli parameters um, that make it, uh, DIC unuseful for uh, model selection. And so we've been using uh, posterior predictive checks. So this is when you um, simulate uh, replicates of the original data uh, using uh, parameters drawn from across your posterior and then compare uh, simulated and observed data sets. Um, it's best to uh, compare some aspect of the data that's not been directly modeled uh, to avoid overfitting. Uh, so in the Denwood paper, they used number of profiles. Um, I've been using the uh, diversity of resistance profiles as measured using a framework uh, developed by colleagues in Glasgow. Um, so this produces um, these uh, diversity curves um, shown here for the three ethnic groups. Um, and so at the left-hand side of the curve, uh, diversity is equal to the number of profiles present. Um, so there are 30 pro 32 profiles in each ethnic group. And then as we move across, um, across the graph, the, the rate of decline in, the, uh, in diversity uh, is dependent on the unevenness uh, and the abundance of uh, profiles. Um, so this is indicating that the Arusha and Maasai have more, um, a more diverse uh, resistance phenotypes. There's also a measure of representativeness, um, which is a type of beta diversity uh, that allows us to ask how representative of the diversity in the observed data are um, data sets simulated using each model. Um, I'll run through the model structure. So we have our data on resistance or susceptibility to a particular antibiotic and uh, model the probability of resistance. This can uh, depend on the probability that resistance is encoded on a chromosome and expressed. We can also feed in a list of plasmid variants, uh, potential variants, and then within the model estimate the probability that each of these is present. So this links to the probability of a particular resistance um, based on whether or not that resistance is encoded in the table um, in that variant. And if it is, it can either be assumed to be expressed or that can depend on a probability. Um, the probabilities have flat priors uh, and are fitted uh, separately in the different host populations. Um, when we include all of these factors in our models, um, the simulated profiles in grey are very representative of the observed uh, data, um, here shown for each species in the Maasai. Um, in contrast, if we include only the chromosomal independent resistances, um, we're unable to uh, produce representative simulations, indicating that uh, the importance of including plasmids in our model. So moving on uh, to inferences made from uh, the most representative models. Um, so we're able to estimate rates of chromosomal and plasmid-mediated uh, resistance, here shown for trimethoprim, uh, and in each uh, ethnic group species combination, we see that resistance is uh, plasmid-mediated uh, dominated. We see a similar pattern across each of our other antibiotics, and this is just kind of showing the potential for horizontal transfer and flow between communities in our system. If we look at the number of uh, resistances that we are estimating as being encoded on plasmids in each of the different groups, so here for the Chaga, the Chaga and the Maasai, uh, we see that five uh, resistances encoded in a plasmid, uh, we infer that to be most commonly present in the humans of each uh, ethnic group. When we move to four, um, we see that now the, the we see more fours uh, in the Chaga dogs than in the Chaga humans, and then in Maasai, um, more frees in the dogs and chickens than in the humans. 
Um, so these kind of patterns are what we would expect if there was dissemination of fruit resistance on plasmids from the humans into the dogs and chickens, and then a loss of resistance in those communities. So, so far the patterns are indicating an, an importance of plasmids um, and are consistent with what we would expect uh, with uh, humans flowing into uh, dogs and chickens. To investigate further, um, I've adapted the model where the chromosomal and um, plasmid uh, resistances are fitted independently in each different uh, host population, and instead fit the distribution of plasmid variants in just a single population, and then uh, have the distribution in the other species derived from this uh, with a process of loss. Um, when we do this, we find that the model with the human source and dissemination from that um, outperforms um, models with any of the other species as a source, um, but perhaps more importantly also is almost as representative as the full genetic model where the uh, distributions are being fitted in each separate um, population, um, which indicates that it may be uh, not unreasonable to consider that all of our uh, species are linked. Um, we also have uh, a postdoc in Glasgow working on uh, identifying risk factors in the human population um, that suggests uh, consumption of unpasteurized milk to be important. Um, and we also have antibiotic resistance profiles in milk, um, which we can use to explore the cattle to human transmission route further. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just uh, leave my summary points up there. And um, thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, thank you, Will. Um, take any questions? Yeah. Uh, probably, probably a dumb question, but why is doing this better than just sequencing all the plasmids? Um, well, we, we just um, kind of, it's just um, cost. Uh, we can't afford to sequence all of them. We do have uh, a subset of our data which um, is being both uh, typed using Mulva and some sequencing. Um, and we hope by, um, you know, looking at that, we're able to validate what we've done with the larger data set, um, and that will hopefully add weight to, to what we've done. But yeah, yeah. Um, so you've talked a lot about each of the different ethnic groups, and so those are the different data sources that you had. So were you modeling each of those separately, or have you also looked at the sort of spatial? Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, they are um, the, uh, the all, all the all of those models are fitted separately in the different ethnic groups, um, and then we do have um, some spatial and temporal differences in the data, which could be incorporated. Um, and then the other aspect is the um, the risk factor analysis. So we have a socio-economic uh, data, um, which will help to uh, determine what differences between the ethnic groups are really driving resistance. Um, so as, I mean, you can see the, the differences between the groups were so large, but we could really sort of narrow in on what aspects of the different ways of life are, are driving the differences. Okay, I think we're out of time. So thanks, um, Will, another round of applause. <laughs> okay, I'd like to welcome uh, Lauren Perrin. Um, to the stage, uh, University of Salford. She's gonna be talking about the ecology of tick-borne diseases uh, in livestock in Cumbria. Uh, or at least I will be when it loads. <laughs> yeah. Forecast of great movies in your, <laughs> in your talk. <laughs> Just building some suspense. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, my name's Lauren, and I've come today from the University of Salford, and I'm just going to give you a really brief whistle-stop tour of one part of my project, um, and I look at the ecology of tick-borne diseases in livestock in Cumbria in the UK. Okay, so first a little bit of background. So why ticks? What are they, and why should we study them? 
Uh, ticks are arthropod vectors of disease which transmit pathogens when they take a blood meal from their host, and there are hundreds of species across the globe, uh, with over 20 in the UK. The most of, important of which is this guy at the top, Ixodes ricinus, which is the questing tick, and it's known to transmit disease both to humans and animal hosts. And uh, while we might be aware of the human uh, threat from ticks, such as Lyme disease, we might not always realise what an impact ticks uh, can have and are having within the farming industry. And I've just picked a few uh, headlines here from Farmers Weekly, which I'm now an avid reader, and Farmers Guide, and other, other, other sites, just to kind of help illustrate my point. Um, I, yeah, so there's been a, a, a long since strong association with, with ticks and hill farming. And with 2.2 million hectares of uplands across the UK, holding up to 44% of breeding ewes and 40% of beef cows, it gives you some idea of kind of the scale of the problem or, or the potential problem that we could have. But of course, it's not just the ticks that are the problem, it's also the diseases which they carry. Uh, there are three main uh, tick-borne diseases in the UK. There's uh, Babesia divergens, which causes red water fever in cattle, Anaplasma, Pagocytophyllum, uh, which causes tick-borne fever in, in sheep and then can increase susceptibility to other infections such as staph, uh, and Larpenil virus, which can have a really high mortality rate in naive flocks, um, uh, particularly when um, co-infection with anaplasma is observed. And it's also uh, an important uh, disease of game birds as well. Um, so in terms of controls, well, there is a vac vaccine available for larping but it's not always readily available and it's um, not always affordable for farmers that are working in really tight margins to try and turn a profit. And with anaplasma, there's no really well-established specific control program. And, and this disease is meant to affect around 300,000 lambs annually in the UK. Uh, so together, hopefully demonstrating that they're a real and pressing threat uh, to our already threatened way of life. And this is only likely in to increase as uh, tick populations increase and there's changing in land use and subsidies and things like that. Okay, so where do we commit uh, our study? So as I mentioned, um, hill farming is often associated with ticks, uh, which are generally on the rise, uh, globally and nationally. And ticks typically exhibit... a uh, a patchy distribution, as you can see from this map that I've pulled from PHE, which uh, shows a uh, ricinus distribution. So one area endemic for tick-borne diseases is Cumbria, specifically the South Lakes, and the University of Salford has had a, a long-standing project set up there where we've been looking at Lyme disease for many years, and having a presence there and talk talking to some of these locals, we became aware of this anecdotal evidence that uh, these farmers could apparently tell that there'd be dirty bits of the fell and, and clean bits of the fell. This common grazing land more, which was a seem seemingly contiguous piece of land and there should be no reason, and the sheep were able to graze freely across it, so there should be no reason for these dirty bits and these clean bits. Um, and they also mentioned these uh, asynchronous cycles of disease, so they thought that um, one farmer down the road might be having a really bad year for lalping, uh, whereas another farmer, he'd be absolutely fine even though their uh, livestock were grazing on the same bits or adjacent bits of the fell. Um, and so it, was, it gave us a really interesting and ideal study site, and we wanted to try and apply some kind of science to these old farmers' tales. And this led us to ask us the question, what makes hill farms tick? Um, and we wanted to uh, in investigate this idea that was previously put forward, that uh, risk is a product of the environmental hazard and exposure rate. And the idea was to take a holistic view of the moor um, and survey the moor and to try and... Um, assess the environmental hazard that's posed by ticks um, and so where are the ticks why are they there and kind of identify any ecological drivers behind this um, are they evenly distributed across the moor or are, are they as the farmers are saying there's these hot spots for ticks and what's causing that and we also wanted to have a look at um, exposure rates and could this be quantified by looking into the movement of individual sheep uh, so do ticky sheep occupy ticky parts of the fell um, and by com combining these two ideas, hopefully determine um, if the tick burden on sheep correlates with the environmental risk posed, posed by the area of the moor in which they graze. Okay, so as to design. For our survey on Bethlehem Moor, uh, we conducted a cross-sectional study of 500 hectares, which is quite a lot of land in the middle of Lake District when you've got uh, no signal and stuff like that. Um, and this common grazing fell, which serves four farms. 
So 500 points were randomly generated, of which over 300 were successfully sampled using a standardised dragging method. It's a very high-tech method where we go into the field, we take a woolen blanket, drag it behind us, turn it over and pull any ticks off that may have attached to it. Um, and this was followed up with periodically sampling randomly selected sheep at two of the farms, depending on husbandry practices. Um, this wasn't taking bloods because we couldn't obtain a home office licence. This was um, using ticks taken off them as a means of kind of xenodiagnosis. Um, and one area of interest to us was this sharing of tick-borne diseases with wildlife as, as deer, which are key host species for ticks. They act as massive buses and can carry thousands, are quite abundant across the, across the fell. Um, and so we wanted to have a look at that and see, see where the hosts were. Um, and in addition, we wanted to fit GPS collars to sheep. It's a natural thing. And then we could plot the individual movement of sheep and follow them on a handy little app and see where our sheep are going and then have a look at where they're going in relation to the deer. And finally, uh, have a look at some genotyping, uh, look at some sequences. And so we see in the same sequence type circulating in the deer as we are in the sheep, which might help us uh, to understand some of these ecological drivers. So did it work? Uh, so I'll just give a quick glance um, at some of our results. So managed to produce a heat map of tick distribution of Bethica Moor uh, through ArcMap. Uh, so this is Bethica here, and you've got Coniston Water just on the west, just to give you an idea of whereabouts in the world we are. Um, each point on the map represents a site that we walked to uh, and dragged a huge effort from a lot of people, not just me. Um, and I'm aware that there are uh, some areas uh, where they're completely devoid of points. Uh, this was unfortunate due to inaccessibility. Um, but using the art map and drag data uh, collected from April this year, we've been able to generate this heat map of tick distribution across the moor. Um, yeah, so th a total of uh, 387 ticks were collected from 329 drags. And from the map, it, it's quite clear that the highest density of ticks um, exists like in, in the top, just beneath this is Grisdale Forest here. Um, and moving south, kind of towards us, the second, I don't know if you can see it, woodland down here. Um, so it's apparent there's not an even distribution across the fell. So what's causing this trail? The ticks can't move very far themselves, so this leads us uh, to believe that it, it's something to do with host movement. And so we thought, well, we'll have a look at the deer. Where are the deer going? Let's map their movement. Um, and this second art map was informed by um, Forestry Commission deer stalkers and local farmers knowledge that spend their entire lives on the fell. And it was confirmed by me getting up at four o'clock in the morning and going deer stalking myself, which I wouldn't recommend anybody to do. Um, okay, um, so at first glance, it would appear that there's some correlation between the layers, between the ticks and where the deer's going. So it would suggest that the deer kind of are a driver towards the tick distribution, but maybe not the sole driver. And so the next step is we're going to look at um, creating a map for the sheep population as well. So just take a quick glance at some of the tick burden data that we're able to collect. Uh, and we've initially plotted the data as a monthly average, and you can see that there is some vari there is variation in tick burden on the sheep throughout the year. Um, so we know that the hazard of ticks varies over time. However, we would expect this as there is massive seasonal variation uh, in the ticks. So then we thought, right, okay, so if we have a look at one month, a snapshot of one month, where the sheep are expo um, all exposed to the same environmental hazard, um, we can still see some variation. Um, um, yeah, sorry, so we can still see some variation when they've all been exposed to the same hazard. Um, and I suppose you would expect to see this when you look at parasite burdens in general. Where lots of work has been done on other systems on intrinsic susceptibility due to immunity, co-infection and sex. But this is quite unique because they're all the same sex, they're all of sexual maturity, um, and they're all the same breed. So it allowed us to be able to look at individual movement. Okay, so do ticky sheep occupy ticky moorland? So we tried to use uh, GPS collars on the sheep uh, to try and plot the movement. And we were promised the earth with these collars. They were supposed to last for 30 days, record data once every hour, and be absolutely incredible. They weren't. Um, apparently, they didn't realise how wet it was going to be in the Lake District over the winter months. And they came back, and they got water damage. They weren't recording. The longest, I think, was recorded for nine days, and it still had a uh, loss of data. Um, and this map here is not very clear. You can see this... That's, that's the amount of data that we had for, for sheep collar movement. And then when we did have some more, that we had loss of service. So. But if we can get it to work, it, in, in practice, it should be quite good. So how does, tick, um, so how does risk translate to exposure? 
So currently our hypotheses are that deer are introducing ticks onto the moor from the woodland, um, and so simpler caricide aren't going to clear the ticks, although personally I think a well-coordinated and well-structured approach uh, would help greatly. We saw a massive decrease in the number of ticks as we were sampling at the farms, purely because of the farmers responding to our presence, which was fantastic for the farmers, but not really that good for our data set. Um, and yeah, and they were all kind of using prawn at different times, whereas I think if they were to work together, it would kind of really help. Uh, and secondly, is that ticky sheep graze on ticky moor, although um, we can't really answer that with that. Another thing that we looked at, if this works, so this is what, why it took so long to load up, was um, building a 3D model of the moor as well. So you can see a bit more clearly here where the, ship are, where the sheep are, where the sheep aren't, and, and this uh, tick, tick density. And this kind of method really helped when we were looking at one of the other farms where the farmer was sure that he just saw the ticks at the top of his hill. Turns out he was right. But it was a really, really handy visual way of being able to see that. So is that done? Okay, so I'll just wrap up by saying um, this is future work, but a lot of this has already been done. There just wasn't really much scope to talk about it today. But if anybody's interested, please come and find me later. Um, we just want to complete the map of um, sheep occup occupancy across the moorland, which we'd expect to be uh, much more smooth and contiguous, uh, and hopefully plot individual data. Fingers crossed, I got a big dump of data last week from the collars, so hopefully it will have worked this time. Um, and to further look into the strains of, of anaplasma um, and to build some phylogenetic trees, which we have started seeing, to see if the same sequence types are circulating within the deer and the sheep, uh, and test for Larf and gill. Um, and another thing that we're looking at is vegetation data. So the ESA have got um, a satellite, and you can get all their data for free. So we can build uh, NDVI images of them and help hopefully layer that all together and try and infer some formal correlations between the layers. Um, and finally, to hopefully um, build some models to start testing different hypotheses to in con inform control strategies and result in lots of nervous ticks. So I just want to say thank you to the university and my supervisors and anybody that's ever been on the moor with me. <laughs> Is there any questions? Thanks, Lauren. Um, yeah, plenty of time for questions. Thrust your arms high so I can see them. Yeah, right at the back on the left. Um, yeah, so they're, they're closed uh, flocks, so the farmers will tend to keep the same amount of ewes within their flock. Um, each time, so you'll always see around about 500 breeding ewes per farmer, so approximately 2,000 ewes on the fell at any one time. Your GPS tracking, yeah. you made a comment that year on year, different, different farmers get a collection of flowers and white. Yeah. That is what we've done. Sorry, so I maybe didn't make it clear. So this was all um, data was collected from the ticks from this year on this farm. We've done other farms in the, throughout the, the, the project. It's a question of these GPS collars. Yeah. Now that it's repeat them, are you also going to repeat the Oh, I'm not repeating them. I've got data wait, sat that's been collected over the last few months waiting for me to analyse that I just received last week. So fingers crossed <laughs> it'll work. Okay, one more super quick question. Yeah, on the side of the back there. So you mentioned maybe adding a vegetation layer. Yeah. So, I mean, since they're so sensitive to many ticks. Yeah. So sensitive to climatic mm -hmm. temperatures, probably. I don't know if it'd be useful for you to add, to get like a nice autonomous layer as well. And also like a sort of rustic layer. Um, with these yeah, that's kind of what I was hoping to do with the, th the 3D stuff, but it's not quite as fine scale as I would have hoped. Uh, initially, when we, we went out last year and did like a pilot study, and we did, we collected uh, like vegetation height, soil depth, um, some soil samples to be able to do like LOI and stuff like that. But for the sheer scale of the moor, it just turned out to be unfeasible to do it for all 300 or 500 points. But no, it would be something that would be really interesting to look at, definitely. Okay, I think we're out of time there. Um, so uh, another round of applause for Lauren. Thanks.
like, uh, um, like to introduce Amanda Minter from the University of Warwick. Uh, Amanda's going to talk about optimal control of a rodent reservoir, leptospirosis in Norway rats. Okay, thank you. Um, so today I want to present an application of optimal control theory for designing rodent control programs. So the photo in the background here really shows the motivation for this work. Uh, this is Pau de Lima. It's an urban slum site in Salvador in the northeast of Brazil. And these urban slums provide the optimum habitat for wild rats, which in turn can transmit number of infection to humans. And given that currently one in three people who live in cities are actually living on these urban slum sites, there's an increasing need to know how to control rodents in these urban habitats. So the work I'm going to present today is part of a much wider project investigating human cases of leptospirosis in the urban slums. So leptospirosis is a zoonosis, so it's transmitted from animals to humans. The primary reservoir in the urban slums is the rodent. Humans primarily get infection from contact with the environment that's been contaminated with the rodent urine, which contains the bacteria commonly called leptospires. So if we really want to prevent human cases of infection, we need to break this cycle of infection. Um, so one way of doing this would be to really reduce the level of contamination in the environment. So a control applied to the environment would be very difficult to achieve in practice, but we can reduce the level of contamination by reducing the population size of the rodents. So currently in the slums, the only control for rodents applied is rodenticide. Now rodenticide is a really fast acting control, it's cheap and it's fairly easy to <coughs> apply but it has a number of negatives. Um, so rodenticide is only applied at the slum houses given approval of the residents, which often they won't give because of the worry of the children contacting the rodenticide or the pets. And also there's this fear that the rodents will actually become resistant to rodenticide. So another control we're proposing is habitat management. Um, and this is all a very broad term, but what this means is reducing the level of suitable habitat by some kind of control. Um, now, we could apply habitat management by perhaps doing some kind of trash collection or preventing access to houses. Um, but uh, however we apply habitat management, it's going to have a positive effect for the, rodent, uh, for the residents. But we need to decide how to apply that in slums. And because it's a new control, it's likely to be expensive. So in order to plan uh, these control <coughs> programs, we want to take into account the changes in the population, um, size of rodents, and also the infection dynamics in the rodent population. And at the same time, take into account the associated costs of these different types of control. Um, and one way to do this is using optimal control theory. So given a mathematical model of infection, the cost of our controls and a time scale for our control program um, with a goal of reduction, um, we can apply optimal control theory and it gives you time-dependent optimal controls given these costs, uh, the time and the effect, the predicted effect that the model um, predicts. So the first thing we need for this optimal control theory framework is our mathematical model. Um, so the model is an age-structured infection model. Uh, rats are classed as um, either being juvenile, subadult, or adult and they're either susceptible to infection or infected and infectious. Um, now, rats are a very good reservoir for leptospirosis, so they don't actually suffer any type of disease. So animals move through the different age classes by maturation. Uh, they then can die. We also have birth in the system, which introduces our first route of infection for the rodents, which is vertical transmission. And this could be animals that are either born infected, become infected by suckling, or simply leave the nest with infection. Additionally, subadults and adults can be infected by environmental transmission, so picking up leptospires from the environment, or by some kind of direct transmission. This could be biting or fighting or any kind of direct contact. And once these animals are infected, they begin shedding leptospires at a constant rate into a state of leptospires, which we track, and the leptospires in this state can then die. So this model's been uh, parameterized uh, using field data, which was collected from the slum site, um, which I, you saw the photo of in the beginning. Uh, but we've extended this model to include our two different types of control. So first of all, we include rodenticide. 
uh, we assume that a target percent of the population um, is targeted with rodenticide, and this leads to an immediate population size reduction. Um, and we assume that the rodenticide has a probability of success, so we don't assume that every animal will contact the rodenticide. We then include our habitat management. We assume there's some kind of suitable habitat reduction, and this leads to a rate, uh, decrease in the birth rate, which in turn leads to a population size reduction. Um, and the notable difference between these two different controls is that rodenticide is going to have an immediate effect on the population where rats are removed instantly, whereas habitat management is going to take, a slur is going to take longer to take effect because you're reducing the birth rate, which in turn reduces the population size. Um, and additionally, we assume habitat management is only a temporary control. So, for example, if we were to uh, perform some kind of trash collection. So additionally, we include our costs of different controls. So for now, we're using fairly arbitrary costs. Um, I'll explain uh, more about that later. And the main uh, patterns we assume is that habitat management is more costly than rodenticide. Um, and we also assign, uh, assign a monetary cost to a rat. So each rat has a cost of existing in the population. Um, and this cost is always more than a control, uh, which means it's always cost effective to do some kind of control rather than no control. And for our time period, we're going to look for optimal controls over the period of one year. And our goal of reduction is to reduce the total rat population size. Um, so even though uh, we're really interested in the infected rats because they're shedding, neither of our controls particularly target infected rats, um, so we're going to target the whole population. So we looked at a number of different scenarios. The first one was applying rodenticide only for the entire year. The second was habitat management only. Thirdly, we looked at a couple of scenarios where we split the year in half. So for the first half of the year, we did rodenticide followed by habitat management, and then the converse. So our first application was um, looking at the optimal controls for rodenticide for one year. So the top plot shows the um, percentage of the population you need to target with rodenticide, and the bottom plot shows the changes um, you'd expect and the number of rats and rats in red and leptospires in purple, as predicted by that age reduction model. And what you see is you have to target a high proportion of the rodents using rodenticide for most of the year, but then this tails off. And this has a very quick effect on the number of rats and of leptospires. Um, the number isn't quite to zero, it's very close to zero. Um, but that eventually, after you stop applying rodenticide, the number of rodents increases back up to its carrying capacity and does so fairly quickly, but the number of leptospires stays at a very low level. So if we compare this to applying habitat management for a year, what you see is you have to reduce the birth rate by 100% for the entire year. And even if you achieve that reduction, you have a slower effect um, on the number of rats and leptospires, and that the number of rats increases back up to its carrying capacity much quicker. Um, and additionally, the number of leptospires increases back up to its carrying capacity. So if we now look at those controls where we split the year in half, if we look at rodenticide followed by habitat management, we see that we have to target 100% of the population rodenticide for the first half of the year, followed by only a small amount of habitat management. And this is because the rodenticide has um, decreased the population to a point where um, you only need a small amount of habitat management to keep it at a low level. But once we stop applying any control, you see that the number of rats, again, very quickly increases back up to its carrying capacity, and that eventually so does the number of leptospires. So if we compare this to applying habitat management first, followed by rodenticide, we see that you have to target 100%, uh, reduce birth rate by 100%, and even if you do that, you still have to target 100% of the population with rodenticide. And this leads to a decrease in the number of rats and leptospires, um, but not as quick as applying rodenticide followed by habitat management. And again, the number of rats and leptospires eventually increase back up to their current capacity. 
So what we see is rodenticide is a fast-acting control, uh, which would be expected. But rodenticide has um, a high number of uh, negatives to using it. And so what we really want to do is perhaps use it with a combination of habitat management. And that was the example where you saw that you had to ha uh, apply a high level of rodenticide, but only a small amount of habitat management afterwards. And it's likely that habitat management is going to have a positive effect on the residents, however we apply it. So I've illustrated um, a temporary control, which probably would be trash collection, but we also ought to look at permanent controls and different types of permanent changes of the habitat for the rodents in the slums. So there are a number of extensions we want to do with this work. Um, and recently we've just found out we've, uh, the project's been awarded a medical research um, uh, Council Global Challenges Research Fund Foundation Award, uh, and this is a, a short-term grant of uh, two years, um, working with low- and middle-income countries um, to prevent infectious disease spread in some way. So the main goals of that uh, grant are going to be to perform field experiments to validate the model. Um, and within that grant, there's a postdoc position to go out to the Brazil to be, uh, manage these field experiments. So if anybody's interested, uh, or know someone who might be interested, come chat to me or Mike Began. And the main purpose of those field experiments is going to see if this model is correctly predicting the effect of controls. Because this model has been parametrized uh, with field data to make sure it's correctly predicting uh, infection level, but we have not been able to validate the model um, in terms of rodenticide and habitat management effects. Um, and secondly, we want to look at costings of controls. So um, I've only looked at arbitrary controls in the absence of um, a lot of more substantial information, but they'll be fully costed as part of this grant. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, is what control scenarios are of interest to the residents? Um, the whole project is an interdisciplinary project, and one of the grant um, proposals will be to uh, look at the residents' attitudes to the current control practices and actually recruit them into the role into designing the current... Uh, well, into designing the future control strategies to really make sure they're on board with the rodent control that's happening uh, where they live. So I'd like to thank my collaborators in Liverpool, Yale and Fear Cruise, and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Amanda. Happy to take some questions. Um, yeah, so rodenticide is a much more effective control. You, ne you need to apply much less. Um, and if habitat management, we, we found a, a way in which it was very cheap to do, perhaps led by the residents, I think that would change the results quite substantially. Yeah. I think if the rodenticide was designed to look less like the pastel, <laughs> <laughs> might be more willing to Perhaps. Learned. Um, I've got a question. I, I guess you talked a little bit about the costs of the red enter site. I'm wondering also about the costs of the habitat management. For example, if it's not comprehensive, maybe you drive rats into concentration spots within slums or something like that. I wonder if you want to comment on that. Um, sorry, do, uh, how, as that as a habitat management. Yeah, for example, if you if you're applying your habitat management strategy unevenly in a in a in an area. Yeah. Would that lead to hot spots and cold spots of, of, uh, of, of rodent presence? I can see that would be the case. So there are some slum sites which are um, fairly close populations because there are valleys and they're flanked by roads. You don't expect rodents to leave. But there are some which are a bit more connected. And so I think we'd have to take into consideration then the effect it would have in controlling one slum site and what that would have next door. Yeah. Um, so there's a, a fairly new rodent control coming out, which is a bait, but when rats um, eat it, they become infertile. Um, and I don't think it's quite ready yet, but I think it would be something we would test with our framework to see if it would be worth doing a trial of, definitely. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks very much, Amanda.
Okay, um, could welcome the final speaker for the session, Philip Donkersley. Uh, is Philip here? Yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, Philip is from Universidad uh, Federal de Vis Vicosa? Visosa. Visosa, okay, I was close. Soft C. Um, and he's going to be talking about uh, detection likelihood and um, a novel pathology in an asymptomatic plant pathogen in Brazil. Thank you very much. Thanks, Philip. Tough. Um, so yeah, we've heard a lot today about pathogens that you can see and pathogens that you can detect very easily. Uh, and I am currently working on an asymptomatic infection, which makes my life incredibly fun and difficult. Um, so I'm just going to give you sort of an overview of how much fun asymptomatic infections can be. Um, so moving out from uh, animal-focused pathogens, this work is on a plant pathogen. So I just wanted to give a quick sort of ecological overview of things. So if you have like an annual cropping system where like you're, you're sowing and you're harvesting within the year, theoretically that leads towards more aggressive pathologies for your uh, diseases. You need to basically, as a disease, you need to come along to the field, um, infect the plant, and be able to reproduce uh, within the year so that you can form like a pathogen base for the next year, the next year's crop. And that means it becomes much more of an uh, aggressive pathology. However, uh, a lot of... Um, pathogens are um, present in perennial plants. And these are plants that stay around through the year and uh, they, they can afford evolutionarily to be more, uh, more slow acting, more passive. They can afford to hide. Um, and this is what we're seeing in, um, well, in our study system, uh, acid lime trees. Um, so asymptomatic infections are really quite amazing. Like you can have, um, you have this problem where you can't see it if it's in the tree. Um, so you have to look for other ways of detecting it, like uh, molecular methods like PCR. Um, they can also uh, have symptomatic equivalents in uh, other organisms in other uh, locations. So this sort of uh, asymptomatic infection can present sort of a novel pathology. Uh, a lot of research has gone into how infections affect the biology of their vectors. And if you have an asymptomatic infection, then it's entirely possible that can still be happening, but again, it'd be subtly different. And the reason we're wor we, we are concerned by these asymptomatic infections is because they can cause um, symptomatic invisible losses um, to the plants over a very long period of time that, uh, say, uh, the farmer won't be able to see immediately. So he'll be planting up his field with all these infected plants that will suddenly maybe one day switch to being symptomatic and wipe everything out. Um, so here we're uh, presenting three short studies on uh, an asymptomatic infection of an agriculturally important pest in, uh, across the world. Um, we're looking at how effective current methods are for detecting these asymptomatic infections. We're looking at the sort of uh, molecular pathways by which a symptomatic infection differs from asymptomatic. And finally, we're uh, just going to introduce a brief short bit of data about how uh, these asymptomatic infections are interacting with their vectors. So our study system is the witch's broom disease of Lyme. It first reported in Oman in the Middle East in the 1980s. Since then, it has spread to many of the adjoining countries, so places like uh, Jordan, it spread to Iran and Iraq, and potentially has spread to India, although there, it could possibly be a different organism there. Um, it's also quite recently spread to the south of Brazil, which is where I've been based. Uh, it's caused by a... Um, uh, phytoplasma, which is uncultured, hence its candidatus status. Uh, it's caused by phytoplasma rotifolia. Um, and as we can see, right, I can understand most people here have probably not seen that many lime trees in their lives. Um, so the one on the left, you see this very classic broom type growth like you see on silver birch here in the UK, just lots of clustering. Uh, it's very easy to tell visually when you've got a really strong infection. In Brazil, these trees are infected, the pathogen is there, but the tree basically looks normal. There's nothing really just to look at it and say immediately, right, there's an infection. And that's what makes life difficult. So when we've got those symptoms, the most, theoretically, the most reliable way to find this infection is using a molecular method. Um, and if you're using a molecular method, you can't test the whole tree. So you have to go on and take samples from the tree. And it's, uh, and also because PCR can be quite expensive, um, compared to, say, looking at a tree. Uh, 
which is quite cheap. Um, you have to rely, you're quite limited in the number of these samples that you can take from a tree at any one time to be absolutely sure it's infected. Um, and this leads to uh, false negatives, where you will have not taken enough samples from, like, you take a sample from a tree, and you PCR it up, and it says there's no pathogen there. But what if there is still a pathogen there, you just haven't got the right bit of the tree? And that can lead to uh, false diagnoses and makes like modeling the distributions of pathogens and identifying areas for control very to be very, very difficult, particularly in new areas of infection like in Brazil. So what we did is we took more samples than a farmer would be able to afford from a series of trees in a field that we knew from previous experiments was infected. And we uh, uh, did a, uh, the standard nested PCR, which is well documented to work in the Middle East on this pathogen, and uh, visualized it using just agarose gel to tell, right, which leaves infected, which leaves not infected. And what you might be able to tell from this picture here is that this is, these are all sa some samples from one tree, and that you have some wells that are definitely coming up with these nice pretty bands, and some wells that are absent, which means we've got false negatives occurring here, which is fat, like, great for me, horrible for the farmer who wants to test, like have, have an easy test. And uh, across all the adult trees, uh, what we found was that on average you had a false neg, like if you took say 100 leaves from a tree, uh, 38 and a half of those will tell you that it's not infected, and 62, and the remainder will tell you that it's infected. And a uh, very similar, uh, well, a slightly greater amount was also found in the saplings, like the young trees. Um, and that's quite worrying. That means that if you want to have an accurate diagnosis of a tree, theoretically, you could take 38 leaves from an adult tree and they would all be negative. Uh, and that, but that's like incredibly probabilistically unlikely. But still, it's possible. Um, and we wondered if this was, maybe this was just our PCR, maybe it was just our method that was going wrong. So we repeated this experiment with another asymptomatic infection, which is another phytoplasma of uh, cassava, another main staple crop, food crop from across the world. Uh, fun fact, this isn't actually asymptomatic, it's just the symptoms occur underground, and you don't want to be harvesting cassava until you're ready to eat it. Um, so technically it's asymptomatic like that. And again, we found this very similar story, that if you take just lots of leaves from the same plant, then you'll get uh, about half of them will tell you that it's not infected. So again, it's, it's uh, this consistent false negative uh, effect occurring across multiple systems. And it's also been found in outside of our lab, so it's not just our lab's problem, um, for another pathogen of lime called Huang Long Bing, which is the yellow dragon disease. It's de basically devastated lime production across China. And there they used a, a similar nested PCR assay and found a 50% false negative rate. Uh, interestingly, they also tested this against a, a qPCR-based assay, and they found that it has a much lower false negative rate, but equally it's also far more expensive. Uh, so that's just one of the difficulties of working with asymptomatic infections. Uh, secondly, we're also curious about what makes an infection asymptomatic. So there are all sorts of things that could be affecting it. Uh, we've theorized in the past that it could be environmental factors, or it could be changes in the host or the pathogen's genome that's occurring in these different areas of infection. So we focused on primarily on the uh, uh, changes in the host uh, response to infection. So we had... Um, have previously identified a whole bunch of genes that are expressed differentially in a symptomatic infection in Oman, and we tested, the, repeated testing these genes uh, in the asymptomatic infections in Brazil. Uh, and what we have here is just a short, uh, a couple of the genes that we found actually were different. So we have these uh, development-based genes of the worky genes, uh, some jasmine signaling gene, and an environmental response gene in MIBA. And of course, we had uh, internal reference uh, controls as well. And I'll just run through these quickly. Uh, the most, the most significant difference we found was that the jasmine signaling pathway in Oman, if you're infected, it's significantly upregulated, and that's theoretically what causes the brooms to sort of flourish. Um, it's all that branching caused by increased jasmine signaling. Whereas in Oman, uh, whereas in Brazil, if you're infected with an asymptomatic infection, the jasmine signaling pathway is is significantly downregulated compared to a healthy plant in an asymptomatic infection, which could indicate why it possibly it's asymptomatic. And um, again, a very similar story is found in the MIBA genes <coughs> and these two, uh, uh, and this worky gene. Okay. Um, so this is theoretically pointing out that there are molecular uh, 
differences in the host response to uh, this asymptomatic infection, and it could potentially point out novel pathways by which we could go around trying to detect its pathogen rather than just relying on a nested PCR, looking at the specific gene activity for something akin to like an ELISA assay. Um, and finally, we also looked at the uh, uh, effects of an asymptomatic infection on host biology. So symptomatic infections have these well-documented effects on host, uh, on, on vector biology. Uh, they can increase their fitness, make them more effective vectors, make them able to produce more eggs and just uh, reproduce faster. And we wondered if the story was held true for an asymptomatic infection. So the, uh, uh, this phytoplasma is vectored by two insect organisms, Diaphrena citri, which is a psyllid, and Hishimonas facitis, which is a leafhopper. They both feed on the plants through, uh, uh, on the plant phloem, and theoretically that's how they transmit the, uh, the pathogen between trees in the same orchard. Uh, we tested several uh, life history traits about, the, all the life history traits we could about these uh, vectors, um, and trying to test if anything was, um, and if there are any similar stories between a symptomatic and asymptomatic infection, and if there's any sort of effect going on. So what was very interesting is that um, uh, Diaphorina citri, the psyllid, uh, which was the only one that we could actually successfully cultivate in the lab, unfortunately, Hishimoto's uh, facitis is a bit of a pain. Um, if, you ha if it's carrying an infection, if it's living on infected tissue, and it's cycling the infection between the plant and the organism, uh, it actually has a much higher intrinsic rate of increase. That is the, uh, the number of eggs it produces and the great growth of the population over time. So like the, not only the egg production, but also the survivability of the eggs. That's actually increased if you're carrying this pathogen. Uh, and if you compare the just raw egg count per organism, it's uh, very interesting. It's a very similar story between Oman and Brazil, which is nice to see. And that if you're carrying a uh, symptomatic infection, the number of eggs that the Diaphorina citri produces is significantly increased. Um, and in Brazil, if you're carrying an um, asymptomatic infection as a Diaphorina citri, you're also increasing the number of eggs you uh, uh, can produce. Uh, we have yet to find the direct uh, interaction between the pa uh, pathogen and egg production, but theoretically it's uh, stimulating egg production through some sort of uh, signaling pathway inside the, inside the organism. So uh, just to close off, false negatives are a real problem uh, when it comes to asymptomatic infections. What's really nice is being able to see your infection, but if you're, looking, if you're working with these asymptomatic infections, which are not unique to Lyme and they're not unique to phytoplasmas, then we need to start working on much more effective methods for monitoring the pathogen. Um, in our case, for this phytoplasma, we're finding that it's hijacking the uh, jasmate signaling and the worky pathways in a different way to how it's already demonstrated to be working with them in a symptomatic infection. And that these, and the, ve the vector benefits, quote, unquote, that um, the Diaphrina situ receives from the asymptomatic infection could be pointing towards a potential symptom of the infection where you have uh, the fitness of your insect pest, which does cause damage, is increased um, by the infection. And therefore, theoretically, you could call that a sore symptom because you're, as a plant, you're not suffering from the disease, but you're suffering from an increased pest burden. So uh, thank you very much. That's it. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, any questions? Oh, I don't know who is quicker, I think, here. Yeah. <laughs> We do have some data on the spatial relationship of um, where the leaves are positioned and how they are related to different branches uh, inside the tree and whether or not that's actually related to clustering of infection. Uh, currently what we're finding from the statistics, which didn't show here because I didn't have time, is that um, it's, it is height related in the tree. So the leaves that are higher up are more likely to have a false negative and the leaves that are lower down, theoretically ones that have been exposed for the pathogen for a longer time and may have possibly have a higher titer of the pathogen are more reliable for producing a result like this. My next question, I mean, if you're getting these false negatives because you're looking at individual leaves, isn't the solution to a problem to be a whole bunch of leaves? And that's the template that we started to diagnose whether the tree is infected. You should take a 
branch, mash that up, that's your DNA sample. You, your PCR will pick out what it's in the page. That's, I guess that would depend on the extraction method you're using. If, it's, um, if you're able to concentrate the DNA from across uh, that entire batch, then that could theoretically work. But you're also in, uh, going to be concentrating a lot of uh, secondary metabolites in the plant, which in interfere with PCR a lot of the time. Um, one of the difficulties we did find was in creating an effective extraction method, particularly for cassava, um, because it has a high, high amount of cyanide in the leaves which does interfere with uh, the, PCR, uh, the DNA uh, replicase enzyme. Um, so I guess what you need to do is, all, in addition to changing the method to be much more um, bulk sampling method, you need to uh, also adapt your uh, extraction method to be better at removing these uh, metabolites. Um, the reason we chose individual leaves is because that has, to date, been the method used by um, uh, most studies of plant pathology in well, in citrus lime. I'd love to know if there are uh, other papers who do like bulk sampling for DNA stuff, uh, for identification of pathogens. That'd be great. Uh, sorry, Paul, we're out of questions. Uh, out of time, I should say. So that draws our session to a close. I would encourage the speakers just to loiter around um, and for anybody who has outstanding questions to come up and say good day. Um, and uh, we can just leave with one large round of applause for all our speakers. Thanks very much. <laughs>